Thank you. This is so much fun. This is my first time in the UK at all. And so when Alicia said, I'm part of this amazing church in London and they will love queer, queer virtue and why can we go? I'm like, and she, and she said, and I'll use my miles to help us. It's like, yes, this is great. One of the groups that I need to thank up front is called Oasis, which is an LGBT ministry in um, uh, Newark, New Jersey, uh, which uh, uh, gave me a writing fellowship to write this book and then uh, funded some films that I'll talk a little bit about later. And, uh, uh, and then uh, had given a grant to be able to take this around to other people. So this is our first uh, jaunt on that, uh, on that uh, trip. But I want to thank Circus Spirit for inviting me and opening it up for uh, uh, a broader group. And I also want to thank the clergy, uh, uh, Lindsay and uh, Lucy Winkett, um, because this stuff is still quite controversial in the church, and, uh, uh, and I'm gonna ask you to think about these things in a new way. Uh, so I'm grateful to be able to be here and, and talk with you tonight. Um, I wrote this book um, for a couple of reasons. I'm, a, I'm an Episcopal priest, and I am also a political strategist. And that's actually how I make my living in New York, as a professional political strategist. Um, and I've observed over the years, with those two careers side by side, um, uh, something that we all know, this is not a surprise to anybody, that, that folks continue to cite religious belief to justify the condemnation of LGBTQ people. As a political strategist, this concerns me because it functions as such a drag on our movement toward justice. As a priest, it concerns me because it is deadly for queer souls. And I've long known deep in my bones that it also arises from a proclamation of the gospel that is blasphemous. Also, as a priest, I'm concerned about the fact that, it, that very often when progressive Christians kind of embrace LGBTQ people, we can do that in this wonderful, warm, welcoming way, but very often we're not able to talk about why, theologically, we know that this is the right thing to do. And that leads to a kind of tepid proclamation that you see on the, in the Christian left a lot. And it leads us, leaves us wide open to attack from folks on the Christian right who say, you know, that we're doing this thing and it's not, it's not biblically justified, it's not true to the theology of the tradition, it's not true to the tradition at all. And I worry about that partly because of the, in, the impact that that has on LGBTQ people, um, but also the impact that it has on the church itself and on our, our ability within, in the Christian left to proclaim a robust and energetic gospel and not just on matters of human sexuality. So I wanted to address all of these issues um, with kind of having this sense in my gut that a gospel that would be good for the queers would also be good for the church. Um, and so this is the book, it's called Queer Virtue, uh, what LGBTQ people know about life and love and how it can revitalize Christianity. The, there are a couple of basic premises in the book. One is that queer people possess virtue according to terms that Christianity itself sets. And the second premise of the book is that the church could learn a lot from queer people about how to live our faith more effectively, um, how, to, how, to, how to be the church more effectively and with greater consequence in the world. 
And what I want to do this evening is just kind of walk you through my, the, my thinking about this and invite your comment on it. And in order to do this, I have this very high-tech presentation. There we go. OK. OK. Don't let the flashing lights, you know, like blind you here. I should have warned you. You know, strobe alert here. Um, OK, so it starts with, the, the, my theological piece starts with this idea that to queer is to rupture. Who knows what this means? Or what, do you know? I mean, have you, what, does this make sense to anybody? What, to queer is to rupture. Anybody want to take a stab at what, what that is? Yeah, it, it, it is. And well, and, and it, it actually is a, is, a, is a reference to something sort of specific, and that is there's an academic discipline called queer theory, right? And sort of the primary impulse in that academic discipline is to rupture false binaries, and very particularly to rupture the binary of male and female as definitive poles. And the point here is that queer folk have to um, we have to carve out conceptual space for ourselves to inhabit because we tend to fall somewhere where, you know, very often in our experience, we're not kind of neatly male or female. You know, we're, we kind of exist like all along this continuum. And of course, one of the reasons that this is important, um, not just for queer people, is because that idea that male and female are definitive poles is simply false. We know that to be false, not just in terms of like sexual identity, but it, bi biologically, we know that to be to be false. So you take this idea of queering as kind of an, a, a, an activity, uh, an impulse, and uh, and it's about rupturing, specifically rupturing false binaries. Um, so, what I see going on in the Christian tradition is an, inc an incessant movement to rupture false binaries. Now, so where do I see that going on? Okay, you've got Jesus who in his person ruptures the idea that human and divine stand sort of opposed to each other, or at least that there's this like clear delineation between human and divine, and Jesus just comes in and ruptures that. And, and that's central to our tradition, you know, that, that that's absolute orthodoxy, the idea that Jesus is fully, fully human and fully divine, right? In the resurrection, Jesus ruptures everything we know about life and death, and then, in all the healing narratives, one of the most important things that's going on there is that Jesus steps into space that was considered profane. When he reaches out to people who are, who are you know, sick, right? He's touching people who were considered ritually unclean. So, you've, so he walks into this place where sacred and profane ruptures that right down the middle. Then, You've got uh, Paul in the letter to the Galatians, Galatians 3.28, with this beautiful statement. He's trying to, you know, Paul's all about trying to get these people following Jesus to be a church, a living community, right? And he's trying to get them to understand that the divisions that they think exist between them don't matter anymore in Christ. And so he says, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer queering, male and female, right there. And he queers every single one of them. And these were the biggest binaries that existed in Paul's day, right? This stuff, these queerings going on here, these are not marginal to the Christian tradition. You know, people, talk, people who are using religion to bash gay people or queer people, you know, will cite uh, biblical verses 
many of which are extremely obscure, you know? So you take these like really obscure, you know, this thing from Leviticus, right? Um, and, and that becomes kind of, as you would think it was central to the faith, and they never are, right? But this stuff, this is, you know, this stuff, <laughs> this is the essence, the very essence of the faith. Now, what does that, uh, what does that lead to then in terms of um, how we live, okay? How we live, that's the, that's the turf that is Christian ethics. And uh, one, of the, one of the biggest binaries that uh, Jesus ruptured all the time when he was talking with people were uh, binaries between self and, and other, you know? So you've got that amazing story of the Good Samaritan where the guy comes up to him and says, I'm trying to figure out how to live all this, you know? And, 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 uh, uh, and you know, so Jesus says, well, you know, what's the, what's the, what are the commandments? And he says, you know, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, and Jesus is like, yep, right, A plus. And then the guy says, well, who is my neighbor? And that becomes this pivotal question for our tradition, right? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, where he flips the whole thing around, you know? He, you know, because it, long story. But, but he's trying to get this guy to imagine himself as this traveler who's been wounded on the road. Who do you hope will come and help you? And we know that that's what he's doing, because at the end of the parable, he says, who was a neighbor to this guy who's wounded on the street? You know, his question was, who is my neighbor? And Jesus' answer is, who is the neighbor to this guy? And it's the Samaritan, and which is a total rupturing of these kinds of categories th throughout. So, so even ethically, there is this call, this incessant, persistent call within Christianity to perceive anew who you and I are, and how we relate to the other people in our world, right? These rupturings are core, core to our theology and to our ethics. So my fundamental premise is that authentic Christianity, authentic Christianity, is and must be queer. The fundamental premise of, the, uh, of my work is that um, uh, the facts of queer experience demand a lived response, high moral character. People don't think about that very often. And in fact, queer people don't think about that very often. But there is there's something amazing that happens in queer experience. And I see people living up like like responding to these challenges with extraordinary um, uh, moral integrity. So, so, so this is what I call sort of the, 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 the path of queer virtue. So first, you have to discern an identity, right? Not everybody thinks that queerness is an identity, but, but I do. Um, uh, so you, you discern an identity that informs and affects how you perceive the how you relate to other people, and how you navigate your most intimate relationships. So there's discernment of identity. Then you have to get honest about that identity inside yourself, and you have to tell the truth about it. You have to tell the truth about it to other people, even when that entails risk, which it does most of the time, meaning that it requires courage to, to do this, right? Then this is about coming out. Queer people have to um, find other people who discern a comparable identity marker. We've got this now, this you know, panoply of, of different kinds of identities at work here, um, but we have, to find, we have to find each other and, then, and, and, and touch each other which, and that can be a physical touch, but that can also be a spiritual touch, or both at once, right? But find each other, build community together, 
And then LGBTQ community has really a, quite a good track record of looking to the margins to see who's not yet included or who is still struggling. And then we, and we figure out together what we're gonna do about that. So I think of this as the path of, of queer virtue. And what I notice is that this path is identical to what Christians are supposed to do. You know, this is the path of Christian virtue too. You discern an identity. For Christians, it's, it's, it's the identity of we are creatures of God, created by God. We depend on God for our very lives, right? Discern an identity. You tell the truth about it. This is supposed to be a core to our mission. We go out, we tell people about this thing that we know to be true, even when it entails risk, and it requires courage. We have to find other people, build community, and then we look to the margins to see who is struggling and decide together what it is that we're gonna, that we're gonna do about it. One of the things to note about this, in terms of, so that this is, I call it the path of queer virtue, you know, and virtue is, the idea of virtue, Aristotle, is that you, it's, it's something you, you, it's a path that you commit to, and you, and you work at it. Virtue is something that you cultivate. It's the, um, uh, there's a wonderful, the mission statement for this place is fantastic because it talks about like, like what this community is and then the last piece says, and we mess it up and so we try again. You know, we know we're not gonna do this perfectly and so we try again and that's what virtue is. Is you, you, you know, you don't always do it right, so you try again. In queer experience, um, it matters to note that even though, so I think of it as a, as a path, but in fact, there's no fixed order here. And none of this is once and done. Um, uh, uh, you know, so like, so the, I mean, like for instance, you, you know, the, the coming out piece, what many of us know, the, you ne it never, it, you never stop coming out. You know, um, long after you've entered the community, you may be very involved in, looking to the margins and helping people out, and you still find situations where you, where you have to come out. And one of the interesting things that's been going on in the past few years as, as we sort of you know, begin to understand trans identity more and more is you have people who, um, who are discerning trans identity who maybe before you know, identified as gay or bisexual or you know, um, and now as trans, and so there's a, some of that is, is shifting as well. Um, and, uh, and the whole community has to continue to grapple with new questions about what all that means for us in terms of our relationships with one another. Um, so, so they're not in a fixed order and, uh, 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 and they relate to each other in, uh, in different ways. None of us wants this perfectly. And there are people who flat out refuse to do certain ones of these steps at all. Um, there are people who flat out refuse to come out for, a, for many reasons. Some people um, because for matters of personal safety, some for professional reasons, all kinds. There are people who flat out refuse to be part of a movement that looks to the margins. Um, and that's what happens in families. It's always what happens in families. You know, different people take different parts of it, of it seriously. But, but, but in terms of the Christian path, I realized at some point, when I saw how clearly that resonated with Christianity, um, I realized that most of what I know about how to try to be a good Christian, I learned from walking this path as a queer person. I learned it from my immersion in LGBT community with people who took this so seriously. And I've learned more about that, how to try to be a good Christian in queer community than I have in the, in the church. Um, and that's not to say that the, the Christians don't take this seriously. There are Christians who take this very seriously. It's just I see people in queer community really walking this walk 
with integrity um, more consistently than, frankly, any community I've ever, I've ever been a part of. The resonance between queer, this queer path and the Christian path is not an accident. And that's a fundamental premise of the, of the book. It's not an accident that these just happen to be resonant. They're, the, they're similar because authentic Christianity has at its, at its core this impulse to disrupt false binaries to queer. That's what Christianity calls us to do. And I think that the church could learn a lot about who we are supposed to be. I think that we could, um, uh, I think we would have, I, there would be this infusion of energy and excitement if, if we could look to queer experience more to understand what we are supposed to be about as Christians, as the church. Partly because, you know, because queer people live this so open, you can see it, you know, and it's a very common experience, it's very visible in our world. So it's easy to look to um, in kind of an aspirational way. So the first half of the book is looking at, uh, at this path and, and exploring each one of these steps and exploring the resonance of the queer experience with Christian experience. And then the second part of the book is, so you know, how does the rubber hit the road for uh, Christian churches? And, and there are chapters on uh, uh, pride, discernment of identity healthy discernment of identity. So it talks about, I talk about pride. Um, coming out. I think coming out is an extraordinary model for evangelism. Partly because when a queer person comes out to somebody, we're not trying to change them. We're trying to tell the truth about something really important that's going on in our lives. And because we care enough about that person, we want them to know about it. And then they've got to grab with what, where that leads, you know, and there are wonderful conversations that happen and people's hearts turn, you know, something amazing happens. So um, uh, I think that could be a, 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 a wonderful model for, for Christian evangelism. Um, uh, there's a chapter on authenticity, which is about power dynamics within the church, and it then talks a lot there about intersectionality and hybridity and the basic ideas there is that we all have we have layered identities and we need to be able to bring those identities to bear in the community authentically and we need as a church to create space safe space for people to do that so that's largely about, about power dynamics um, and then in terms of looking to the margins there's a chapter on hospitality which which really is about scandal and the, scan the scandal in queer experience which translates into uh, the, the scandal of, of the cross and the scandal of, of, of Christianity. That, that thing in Christianity that's constantly trying to take you by surprise, you know, because it's not the way things are supposed to be. Um, so, that's, uh, uh, so that's how the ethical piece of the Here endeth the lecture. I, um, I'm uh, uh, Martin Hennig. I'm, I'm a priest from Oxford. And I, I came into the church. I wasn't a Christian. I was a lapsed Jew who came into the church uh, about, um, uh, about 14 years ago uh, in a feeling of annoyance and anger. There'd been an affair where uh, uh, Jeffrey John had been uh, forced to resign yeah. as, uh, as, 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 bish as Bishop of, of Reading. And I thought that this was so anti-Christian and unjust. And it, 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 it awoke a feeling of, uh, of, of, of justice and a feeling that this was anti-Christian, that the church was behaving in a way that was totally wrong. And I came in, and, and, and uh, all sorts of things happened, which actually ended up in me being 
ordained, but I, but I've got, I, I, I feel everything that you have said very strongly. And indeed, mm. I was here this morning, actually, for the uh, service connected with animals, because I'm, uh, I'm the vice chairman, uh, I'm the vice president of the Anglican Society for Welfare of Animals. But it's because I think the same injustices to animals. I think we have speciesism as well. We, 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 we need constantly the thing ripples outward so it's justice for everybody whatever their sexuality and also for whatever their species because it goes it it, it, it and and that's what christianity for me is all about and that's what i want to spend the rest of my life uh, uh, actually proclaiming uh, so i think this was wonderful Thank you, and 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 I and I want to just say I, I appreciate that v very much because um, because part of what I uh, uh, um, what's very important to me in this is is that um, while there's no question that in terms of a Christian path this informs I hope it would inform how the church treats. LGBTQ people, how the church looks upon queer experience, but, um, but the idea of queerness within Christianity is not confined to a discussion about human sexuality. That business about rupturing binaries r really does play out constantly in, in all of our dealings, you know, human dealings, de dealings with the environment. There, you, you can use that to, to ponder how we are to respond to just myriad challenges that we that we that we face. Well, are we going to break and do for food, or how are we going to? Could I ask a question? Is that right? Just a, yeah, Ian, sorry. Hi. <laughs> um, sorry, another clergy person. So uh, my name is Ian Mobsby with the New Monastic Community in uh, Peckham. Now, um, can we go back to? I'm really interested in your idea of rupture, mm -hmm. rapture, and I'm trying to make the connection with some of Richard Raw's writing when he talks about non-dualism. Um, and also that the rupture connects with paradox. And what he talks about is that paradox is connected to what he calls trans-rationalism, which is that you know, our world of binary is locked into rationalism. Yeah. And it needs paradox as a rupture to understand trans-rationalism, which is about Christian spirituality. Um, so I'm just interested to hear where you, what you think about that and the connection between queering and paradox. Somebody asked me uh, recently uh, I, I, an interview, I was talking with the, um, uh, some of the people who are working on um, uh, greater uh, inclusion for LGBT people in the United Methodist Church in the uh, States. And, uh, and, and the, the, the person asked, um, uh, why, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question, <laughs> but, the, the, but the paradox is, is what it's about. The person asked me, why uh, uh, does the church, why is the church so hung up on this issue? And, uh, and I thought about that a little bit, and I, uh, uh, and I said, um, I think it's because the church gets caught up in the paradox of knowing that we're supposed to rely on God and not really trusting that we can, you know? In the chapter on touch, uh, uh, I look to, uh, th th there's this Hebrew word, nagah, which uh, appears in lots of places. One of the places that it appears is in the story of Jacob wrestling the angel. And when the, uh, when the angel, uh, they, they wrestle all night, and, and the angel delivers this brutal blow to Jacob's thigh, and, uh, uh, and the word for the, sh sh the striking is naga. And, and it's the touch of God is what it is, right? And it's a paradoxical touch because it simultaneously cripples him and heals him. 
You know, it's because he limps, he has to limp off to see Esau, that it's because he's limping that he's got to rely on Esau's love and forgiveness. It's the, it, it's, so, you know, so Jacob has been so fiercely independent, his independence is now completely compromised. And, and, and it's that, it's that touch. It, it shows up in Isaiah, Isaiah's in this tabernacle, and with, you know, angels flying all over the place, and it's, terrifying and it's glorious and um and 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 he and he becomes so self-conscious of his own unworthiness and and uh uh and he says woe is me for i am a man of unclean lips and this seraph goes and plucks this charcoal right out of the the, the you know, this this coal right out of the charcoal thing to, in order to say <laughs> you've got unclean lips well we can take care of that um and uh presses the coal to his mouth and sears it, you know, and immediately the one on the throne, God, says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah doesn't miss a beat and says, here I am, send me. So there's this thing that happens with this searing, and it's the touch, the angel touches it, naga, right? This paradoxical moment of excruciating pain and absolute freedom and I, and I, that, that's the paradox that I think the church gets caught up in, right? And, 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 and queerness is the, the impulse that constantly pushes us into that paradox, you know? That, 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 uh, that willingness to enter into liminal space, transitional space, you know? You've got that, that dawn, you know, where it's not quite night anymore, and it's not quite daytime anymore. There's a paradox, and, I, and, I, and that's, that's why we are a challenge to the church. Does that answer you? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've been thinking as you said this about... Um, I've been thinking as you've said this about the connection between, so the parallels, right, between this queer path you're describing and the Christian path that you're describing. And I'm also thinking, okay, so what is toxic? Therefore, what's the flip side of that? What's toxic to the queer path and toxic to the Christian path? Which I think might get to some of this paradox that you're saying. It might help if I tell you that I'm a Wheaton College alumni. <laughs> um, and so I've spent the last 15 years unpacking fundamentalism and trying to figure mm. out what has been life-giving and what has not been right. life-giving. And I think right. part of it, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this, is that in fundamentalism, um, because the other piece of this is I also do interfaith work and I mentor Muslim teenagers now. And I'm trying to unpick the parallels. In fun and in fundamentalism, there's only one right answer. You can't have a spectrum. You have to conform. And in Christianity and in Islam, I think yeah. there's, there's this place of you can't rupture anything because if you do, you're dead, you're gone, you're guilty, you're going to hell. And I'm thinking about, so these things that were toxic in, you know, the the religion that I was handed growing up that said, you can't rupture, right? Because that would mean there's another way to look at things. Right, right. And I'm wondering sort of what the equivalent is in that queer experience, because that's so enmeshed with the religious conversation. Yeah. But so much of, I feel like what has been, and I feel like this path that you're saying, which is so life-giving and so liberating, when you can say, well, I'm telling the truth, even if that does rupture, but that you're not allowed to, to do that in so many places, because if there's only one right answer, we can't handle paradox. That's just, that's not even an option on the table. God can't be a mystery. God has to be knowable. Mm -hmm. Your life can't be a mystery. Your life can't be this queer, different thing. It has to be knowable and definable. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering just if you have thoughts to help sort of untangle <laughs> that those things which are toxic, and how do we get people into that bridge then where they can see yeah. the rupture is possible? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, actually, you know, I think you've actually, you've just spelled it out actually pretty well, you know. Um, uh, this business about entering into liminal space takes tremendous, it's, it's such a risky thing to do, you know. Any aspect of this, like discerning this identity that doesn't sort of fit into this neat mold, telling other people about it, I mean, you know, reaching out and touching other people, and you don't have to be queer to know how terrifying it is to fall in love for the first time, you know, or to engage someone sexually. Um, for the first time or the 50th time. I mean, you know, these, the, the ways that we, 
um, sort of, you know, let all those, the, the, those categories sort of drop in order to, to, to stand in, in the greatest authenticity you can stand in. Um, it takes enormous courage, you know, that, 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 that never stops. And what is so hard for me as a priest to see, and this kind of comes back to the, the business about the church and paradox, is the way that church can become, in fact, um, the, you know, the, the, the guardian of those boundaries, right? You know, the one that actually does the punishing for the people who are trying to be authentic, you know? And that's, that's toxic. That's toxic, right? There's, um, uh, there's this amazing kind of one-two thing that happens in scripture, and I'd never noticed it until I was writing the book, where uh, Jesus renames uh, Peter, you know, you, now, you will be, now you will be Peter, right? Um, uh, and on this rock, Peter, it's a, a word play, Petra, on this rock, I will build my church. And he talks about having the keys to the kingdom. Two verses later, Jesus is explaining that he's going to have to go to Jerusalem and he's going to be killed. And Peter says to him, God forbid it, that this should happen to you. And Jesus says to him, the most withering thing that gets said in the Gospels, get behind me, Satan. For you are a stumbling block to me. And the, the Greek word stumbling block is scandalon. You are a scandal to me. Right? And basically what, what Peter has been saying, this idea that you're going to go to Jerusalem and be killed, that's scandalous. That's not the way things are supposed to be. And Jesus flips it around. The reason that it matters to connect this to this previous thing that just happened is because it comes to this point of toxic religion, how easy it is for the church to be scandalized by the very message we proclaim. You know? And that's toxic. Get, and Jesus calls it out. Get behind me, Satan. For, you're a, for you've become a scandal to me. Um, I, was hope, I was wondering if you might be able to unpack a little bit about your kind of connection between coming out and evangelism because like um in my experience both personally and second handedly <laughs> coming out is very traumatic and continues to be traumatic mm. again and, and again and the evangelism that i've seen is something that is filled with great joy um and is very much we know we're right and we have our whole church behind us and we have God behind us and we're going to go out and spread this message whereas coming out is very much something that's like oh no <laughs> don't do that and often your church is vehemently against that and maybe even in a, like the person that you are coming out to is the church and that is not going well um, and you are told that God is against you in that and so I was just wondering if you could kind of, maybe your like, idea of evangelism is vastly different to that, and it's a really short answer, but yeah, I'd just be interested to hear a bit more about that comparison. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, so, um, so one of, the, one of the distinctions, I think, between, um, between Christian evangelism and coming out as queer is that um, uh, Sometimes when a person starts to come out as queer, they haven't yet got a community behind them, right? And, and very often, if Christian evangelism, you've got a, you've got a community um, behind you. But that's why the, the, these don't come in a particular order and go, and go back and forth, because the truth is, once you've got community, it's vastly easier to, to come out, right? So, um, uh, so I was a, a, a college chaplain for a few years. It was great work. Um, and uh, uh, in a very short time, what had been this very small ministry began to kind of explode. And what was going on was um, students would, uh, you know, we had this little community where people could do things like sort of be authentic with each other, you know. And um, so they'd go out to their dorms and 
there would be uh, somebody struggling, you know, and having a rough time, and feeling very isolated, which is what happens for a lot of people. And, um, and the, the students would say, um, maybe it would help if you had a community of, of good people, you know? Um, and, 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 the, you know, so, you know, and, and if you want to come with me to our chapel service or to you know, Bible study or whatever, come and I'll go with you, you know? And, uh, and folks would come. And that was how we began to, the numbers began to explode, you know? And it wasn't people sort of buying into an idea, it was looking for a, a relationship you know, a, co a community to be part of. And that's the key thing about coming out, whether it's coming out as queer or coming out as Christian, is that it's about a relationship. It's about establishing a relationship with, with somebody else where you're both trying to live a healthier, live into something healthier. We, and then, and then there, there's politics in this, which is really important, and this is important for queer people and it's important for the, for the church. We know, that actually there are studies that, have, that show, bear this out, we know that the single factor that most informs how somebody feels about the issue of homosexuality, right, or, or, or queerness more broadly, trans identity, whatever, the factor that most influences someone is whether they know somebody who's queer, right? Um, and so we've long known that coming out is, a friend of mine once said, never a morally neutral act. Not coming out is never morally neutral. Um, and I say that with great respect for people who, are, who, who deal with, with you know, some measure, where there's a safety issue at, at stake, because there's a safety issue for a lot, of, a lot of people. But the way we have built community, this is another Paradoxian, the paradox of needing to have community in order to have some measure of safety, but the tremendous risk that you have to take in order to do that. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so you, you, know, you step out of the closet, whatever your identity is, and you make it that much easier for the next person behind you to, to come out. This matters to me as a form of evangelism within Christianity. Because, because what has happened on the Christian left is that folks on the Christian right have claimed the mantle of Christianity and Christian proclamation with greater and greater audacity, and those of us on the left have largely sort of just laid down and let them do it, you know, so that, so that now folks just assume that Christianity, for instance, as a tradition, is hostile to LGBTQ identity. And I read scripture and I see exactly the, exactly the opposite. That's a problem of evangelism. That's about those of us on the left not being out enough with our, with our faith. Very often when I'm talking with people, somebody at some point says, okay, what can I do? And honestly, that's the, for those of us who identify as Christian, the most important thing any one of us can do is to come out as Christian to the people, to the people around us and begin to cultivate a different mindset about what that means. I researched Christianity from a sociological point of view, and recently I was in the U.S. doing field work, and I went to a mega church, and I saw in the book shop, there were, in the kind of the recommended books, there was a book called Gay or Happy, and it was about somebody who had been saved by a miracle of his gayness, and was now heterosexual, and, and so on and so forth, and I guess you know, I've been away from the U.S. and I do my research on Christianity here in the U.K. I guess my question is that I grapple with is why there's this enduring fixation with sexuality um, at the Christian right and why it doesn't seem to be dying down. Um, and you mentioned these sort of random verses that come out of Leviticus that are used. And I think that part of the answer is this sort of certainty and safety that comes with binaries. But I don't think that's the whole answer. I think there's, there's got to be some other reason why this fixation is so big and continues for decades now to produce books and talks and uh, conversion therapies and ways to cure it. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. 
You know, it, um, uh, I wrote this book with two audiences in mind, queer people sort of broadly, anybody who's been burned by hateful proclamation, and that's all queer people. Um, and then the progressive, the progressive church. What has surprised me are the number of folks who identify as progressive evangelical who have picked up the book. And I'm now in dialogue, I never expected this, I'm now in dialogue with all these self-identified self evangelicals who see in this hope for their own movement, you know? And these tend to be younger, younger people, you know, who, who are deeply distressed by the right wing of the evangelical party, if you will, sort of in, in the United States kind of being in bed with very conservative politics. You know, and they see that they, and this is kind of going on in evangelicalism broadly across the U.S. and perhaps here as well, I don't know, um, but uh, where people are beginning to question some of the things that have just been, you know, just orthodoxy for them for, for, for a long time um, on questions around human sexuality, uh, uh, treatment of women, um, uh, environmental policies, you know, uh, all kinds, all kinds of, of things, and they and they and they are seeing in this um, a new way to conceive of Christianity, um, and and really engaged in it. You got it. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was going to say speak, but I think you said what I was going to say. Um, Although I used to be in this church, I now live in Wilwell, Wiltshire, about 70 miles west, um, with this, a team of Wilwell parishes. Um, and a few months ago, I got married to my partner, David, as a lay minister. And the only response I got was total support from the bishop down. And the only official response from the church was a, a, a very nice card saying congratulations to the bishop. Mm. And, and I think we assume, because nothing is said, but the vast majority of the sent to the middle ground that they are nervous about sexuality. In fact, my experience is that the vast middle ground I can't be bothered. They've moved, moved on beyond it. And I think only, even within the evangelical um, church, large numbers are moving and shifting. And so I think we can assume that homophobia is still a big problem. And because it's not talked about, actually, people that aren't bothered about it, they've moved beyond homophobia, and they're very supportive. Yeah. And we can make the problem bigger than it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if this will resonate with you, is what is in my mind is that people who are extremely, what, what I, I came up with a term some years ago, extreme social conservative, and that these people frequently but not always identify as Christian and recruit God to be their weapon that says you may not disagree with me. So they have co-opted Christianity when they themselves are not actually Christian. They don't actually pro follow any of the principles that um, you described about what is uh, living in a Christian manner, having a Christian an orientation towards the experiencing God within yourself and how you facilitate that. So that they have recruited God to be their weapon and you uh, are, for example, their target for say, I am right, you are wrong, and that this is about empowerment for them. They need this weapon to make themselves feel other than powerless. I think you can definitely see that going on uh, uh, for some for some folks. And I'm going to just get over here. Um, uh, I do want to be just a little cautious because um, there are also people of uh, there are people of good heart who are conservative Christians who in some ways are living a gospel proclamation better than a lot of folks on the, on the left. The, 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 but the question really does become, are, and you're touching on this, has this now become a weapon, a weapon that, that, that actually harms people? Um, and there is no question that, uh, that there, is a, there is a kind of to toxic Christian proclamation out there that is, uh, that is being used against queer people, and there is no question that there are queer people, and especially young people, who are literally killing themselves as a result. Um, I mean, it is, it is not just toxic, it is deadly. It is, it is deadly, and it matters so much that that, that that impulse, that deadly impulse within the, the, the tradition be um, uh, uh, dismantled. 
You have a question? <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, yeah, thanks for your talk. And I found it quite interesting theologically, your comparisons of rupture, you know, queer rupture and Christian rupture. Um, I was thinking about kind of the categories you spoke about, you know, briefly mentioned there and rupture. And I guess I want to offer a, a kind of a devil's advocate of approach here. In some of the categories you have, um, like Jew or Greek, it's almost as if when Paul was speaking of that, he was almost erasing these categories and kind of unifying everyone in those terms. But there are some other categories like um, human and divine, mm. where the binary difference is not erased there you know in the early church councils the both categories are necessarily ha are necessary for the meaning of Jesus's divinity to be so amazing likewise in the trinity they have to have the necessary existence of father son and spirit for the different personalities of god to become apparent in those relationships so I guess my question was, in terms of these rupture, are these categories necessarily erased or does sometimes the rupture actually reinforce the necess necessity or the existence of these binary differences? I don't think the categories get erased, you know? I think what it does is change comprehension of what those categories mean or what they're capable of. Um, I, don't, doesn't, I don't know if there's a clear answer, but it's, but, um, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of Jesus being f fully human and fully divine is kind of mind-bending. You know, we have this, the, 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 um, the, there's the, this theology of the ascension, it's very Catholic. James Allison has written brilliantly about this. The, the, the idea of the ascension is that Jesus ascends bodily to heaven, and so he goes, you know, he goes back to heaven, and he takes this piece of humanity with him, you know, so that we're sort of there, you know, where, wherever that is, you know, we're kind of, kind of there. And, um, and I can't quite wrap my mind around it. I mean, it, you know, so it, 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 it is rocket science, you know, it, it, it is brain surgery. It's like I can't, and I, and I think that, uh, that, there, that, that this impulse to rupture those, those categories is not about erasing them, it's kind of about cracking our minds open to see possibility there and constantly to be taken by surprise by it. I mean, it comes kind of back to this idea of not getting completely fixed in, or entrenched in, in, a, in a particular mindset, and particularly one that, that, that pits us against each other, that casts me as right. I'm certain of my, of, that, I'm, that I'm right about this, and every single one of us does this about different things, right? But there's just this kind of constant challenge. Um, uh, but Jesus being fully human and fully divine, I can't, I can't can't wrap my mind around that, you know? So, like in my preaching, I sort of, t I tend to go kind of back and forth, you know? I'm fascinated by the stories about Jesus, Jesus in his humanity, because we, we often don't, in my experience, but preachers often don't, we preachers often don't spend a lot of time in, in him being human. And there are extraordinary stories. Can I look at I'm going to get to somebody else back here. Can we go, go, go find, get, get some folks in the rafters there? <laughs> uh, going back to the topic of evangelism, I was just wondering if you have any experiences or advice for, uh, you know, when we deal with people who are very close to us, who are LGBT, but they've had negative experiences with religion in the past, understandably. And so because of this, they have a very negative opinion of religion in general. And it's actually, sometimes it's actually harder for me to be, uh, to come out as a Christian to my LGBT friends than it is, you know, with my Christian friends as a, uh, LG, as a gay person. So I was wondering if you have any experiences, how do we uh, sort of evangelize the people, or at least be honest with people who are, who've had negative experiences about religion in the past, and how do we try to share the positive 
aspects of it with them. It can be very hard because you don't want to marginalize their negative experiences, but it's, it's difficult for me, so I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Thank so, you. So what, tell me what the, give me, give me the, give me the question that's here. So, the, okay, so if we, if, we, if we have people in our lives who are LGBT and they're not religious, and in fact they actually have a very negative opinion about religion because of their experiences. So how do you do, yes. Yeah, how do you like deal with that? This is why, um, this is why coming out matters so much, right? Because, because you're talking about a situation where somebody may be afraid, maybe harm, maybe, you know, it is a little bit of a reverse of, of coming out as queer because, because, as a, because as a queer person, the hostility you may encounter is largely not based on the woundedness that that, that, that person has, has experienced. Sometimes it is, but, but it's largely not. Um, uh, but, but there is, it, mat it, it, it matters so much to be able to witness to a different kind of faith precisely because queer people have been so wounded by that, you know? Somebody told me a story just a couple of days ago, and it, this is, you hear this story all the time in, uh, among queer people. This is somebody who grew up with, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an evangelical background, became involved in an evangelical community, um, and, and then as she began to, to discern a lesbian identity, she gets ca cast out, and not cast out kind of nicely, oh, you can't come here. I mean violently, spiritually violently, you know? And, and so, that the, so you've got this person now who finds a, you know, a progressive and affirming church and sits down with the rector of that church who says to her, you know that that was all a lie. Everything with that, all the hateful stuff, that's not true to Christian faith. And she took it in and, yes, okay, I get that, I get that, and still struggles with that interior sense. No, maybe they were right. So the only way you heal that is by, is, is, is by sort of being the person who lives something different from that, who embodies it. And that's what coming out is. You embody a, a different message. You know, you are, you are that message in conversation with other people. Then the last thing I'll say is there will be people who will say, I don't want to hear it. And it matters to respect that too. Because those wounds are real and they are grievous.